What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years and it's just mind blowing. Birth Story, Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a -a one-of-a-kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources. If you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth, but there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story, hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula, and I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me. But I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at birth story podcast. Episode 25. All right. If you did not listen to episode 24, this is a two-part series. So I need you to like push pause or stop, go back to the podcast app and click on episode 24. Episodes 24 and 25 are all about meeting Jasmine. 
If you just listened to 24, then you know you're getting ready to hear Jasmine's surrogacy story and then her postpartum period where she was diagnosed with leukemia. This particular episode is all about honoring surrogacy, what the process is like, how joyous and how difficult it can be for the caring provider, and then what it's like to get a diagnosis that you were never expecting right after you had been completely selfless with your own body and now needing a donor of your own. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I hope that you'll spread the word about it. Well, that is going to lead us, Jasmine, into birth number three for you. And I just, oh, I have so many questions about surrogacy and being a surrogate. But I, oh, I just don't even know where to start because I just, first (laughs) of all, I just think you are superhuman. You sound like the complete opposite of the type of pregnant person that I was. (laughs) And so I really like I, you know, it's a mixed bag. I love hearing people that just like basked in pregnancy. I was not one of those women. (laughs) so I was just not the glowing, beautiful, (laughs) gentle, pregnant person. I would definitely have never volunteered to be a surrogate because at the end of my births, I was thinking, get a vasectomy as quickly as possible. (laughs) But you were, you know, younger, your body healed Mm -hmm. beautifully. You had great pregnancies and labor and delivery. And then you immersed yourself into the birth world. Yeah. So walk me through, you have two beautiful daughters and you're married and what the journey looked like and, and how you became a surrogate. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, for me, I did have such great pregnancies and I loved being pregnant and I know that's not the norm. (laughs) So I thought, you know, it just, I enjoyed pregnancy and I really enjoyed that second labor so much. I thought that was such a breeze. I felt so powerful. And, and so I really wanted to be pregnant again, but being honest with myself, I really didn't want to have any more of my own kids. And I started joking that I was going to be a surrogate. You know, I had other friends who were sort of the opposite and they didn't want to be pregnant again, but they wanted more kids. And I would joke like, well, let me be your surrogate. I'll just start having babies for everyone. And the more I joked about it, the more it kind of started getting into my head that it might be a possibility. And so I started looking into it and I started researching surrogate agencies. And that's actually how I got started. I, after like researching agencies for a little while, I found one that I really, really clicked with. And I talked to them on the phone just kind of learned about the process and really liked them. And I decided that I would go ahead and go through with, you know, just filling out an application and see what happens because you essentially fill out like a little form and it just sort of kind of helps them connect you with a family. And I thought, well, let me just see, see what's out there. And so I filled out the form and right away, I mean, on paper, I probably looked pretty good. You know, it's like healthy babies, prenatal yoga teacher, you know, all the things. And Dula, I just young. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, all these families were, <laughs> were getting in touch with me and I was still breastfeeding. And so I said, you know, okay, hold on, let's wait a minute. I want to not be breastfeeding because I knew I would have to go through IVF and I didn't want to be on the medication while I was breastfeeding my baby. So I waited until she was done breastfeeding and that she waned when she was around three so I actually waited a couple years and sat on it and thought about it for all those years and kind of prepared myself for the idea of it and then went back to that same agency and said, okay, I'm ready. And it didn't take too long before I was getting matched with families and then eventually just found a family that I clicked with. How many families did you kind of meet or get introduced to before you found like your perfect match? Mm, there were many some of them, it would only go as far as some phone calls. Okay. Um, sometimes you would Skype them. There was one family that I just adored, and we actually drove out to the Bay Area to go see them. We stayed at their house, uh, met their other child that they'd had through surrogacy. They were so wonderful, and then something fell through, and I couldn't actually work with them. So that was kind of devastating at the time. I just They wanted everything I wanted. They wanted like a water home birth and you know, they were just like really lovely people. 
Um, and then there were others that you just kind of know right away it wasn't going to be a great match. Because okay. you can really, um, there's so many families out there and really find people that you have similar desires, you know, so. I was going to say that makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, you're emulating their pregnancy in many ways. And so yeah. just the energy that you breathe in and to and through the baby throughout those months, you know, hopefully would feel familiar to the, yeah. you know, to the baby of the surrogate versus the birth mom. That makes sense to me. So how did you get matched? Kind of what did that look like when you finally had a like, yes, yes, on both sides? Yeah, well, a lot of it was done through the agency, which uh, was an interesting experience. It, sometimes it felt a little um, like a lot of paperwork and, and not as intimate as you would think. But I also really appreciated it because they understood the legal stuff that I didn't understand. Okay. And so it kind of, you know, once you start to get deeper into it, you realize it's sort of a, a strange transaction. There's a lot of heart in it, but there's also a lot of legal stuff that needs to be dealt with. And so a lot of the... Um, conversation happened through the the agency and that team and you kind of get assigned certain people that are on your team and I really grew to love them I learned that you know if you're going to be a surrogate loving your agency that you're working with is super important because those are your people they advocate for you they're kind of like your surrogate doulas <laughs> okay <laughs> they're, they're really there for you and they really understand the things that you know why would I know the legalities of surrogacy <laughs> But yeah, so a lot of it happened through them. And then I, of course, would, you know, communicate with the family and, and it was just sort of, they were along the ride with me as I went through the IVF process and, and yeah. I was going to say, so how involved do they get to be? Like, do they, do they get to be there um, for the transplant or the ultrasounds? It's really up to them. And it's also kind of up to you as the surrogate as well. So that's why it's important to match with somebody who has similar desires as you. Okay. And I actually had a family who lived in China. And so they were really far away from everything. And they had the different time zone. Wait, so, it, so this baby number three, hold on, this baby number three, you're in California and you're being a surrogate for a couple in China. Yes. Wow. I did not <laughs> see that coming. <laughs> First of all, I have a million questions about international surrogacy. So that's a thing then. I didn't even yeah. know. Okay. So that's yeah, a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. Wow. And I guess it's it's pretty popular, actually. I, I know, of course, I didn't know this either until I got into it, but I learned that it's pretty common to, um, yeah, pretty common for people to go to other countries and have this service. They, as far as I know, they don't do surrogacy in China. Okay. Um, so they needed so this, to seek you know, that outside. Yeah. So, and I guess it's quite popular for them to go to Australia. Um, and also the LA area of California is kind of a hot spot, and that's where I was. <laughs> wow. So do you know their story at all? Like, did they have children um, prior or were they never able to conceive? They, I do know their story and it's, um, it's a wonderful one, but I'll just be kind of delicate Yes. Just that they were unable to conceive after many, many late term losses. They endured so much, like so much more than I can't even imagine a family enduring. And they all they wanted was children. I mean, they were the sweetest people. And I think that's really what drew me to them. It was just like, I don't know if I've ever met a family who just wanted children so much the whole family, everybody, you know, grandma was involved, aunts and uncles were involved. It was a whole family affair mm -hmm. <laughs> to bring to bring this little baby into the world. And something that I loved is that what we were able to do was this was actually biologically their child, which is not that common. But they were able to create an embryo with, you know, both her and him and had a and had an embryo. So it was really cool that they didn't need a donor, you know, an egg or a sperm donor. Yeah. It was it was 100% their baby. And I just, for some reason, really thought that was pretty neat. Oh, I think this is so beautiful, Jasmine. <laughs> uh, and the fact, like, the more I hear you talk, and I mean, I know everyone that's going to be listening to this podcast is just going to be like, who is this goddess of an angel, <laughs> you know, that would do this? I mean, you are incredible that you, that you see 
their pain and then you provide an answer and life. I mean, oh, I just want to hug you if I was anywhere near Oregon or wherever. Right. That's where you're living now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so big virtual hugs right now. Tell us about the process when you are a surrogate. You know, we kind of breeze through a little bit of it, but like what types of medications, how does the process begin like chemically with your body? It was um, a lot of medication that I tend to lean toward more natural things. So that was actually pretty hard for me. I sort of underestimated how powerful some of those medications are and how wacky you feel when you're on them. Um, But it was really similar to anyone else who's ever been through IVF. Uh, Just you had to do, you know, the shots in the butt. I had to take uh, different pills. I think uh, progesterone and I can't even remember. There were so many. It was handfuls of pills. And then I never was able to give myself the shot. My husband would have to do the shot for me (laughs) every day. I kept telling him, "Okay, tomorrow I'm going to do it. And then I would chicken out. (laughs) Yeah. And it just, I think it also depends on the doctor. I remember them telling me different doctors will do it different ways. So we had a really good doctor in LA and they had me sort of hopped up on all these meds, getting me really nice and fertile, um, kind of thickening the lining of my uterus and sort of tricking my body into thinking that it was pregnant. And so I felt very pregnant and I wasn't, I was sick in the morning and moody And I started to get a little bloated and I I really did feel quite pregnant. And then they would take the embryo, which had been, you know, it's already created and it was frozen and they would take the frozen embryo and insert it into my uterine wall and hope that it sticks. And we had one where it didn't. And if, and that was, that was really hard. I didn't expect it to be hard because I knew that that was definitely a possibility, but this particular family, they didn't have a lot of embryos. And so they were only injecting one at a time. And I also didn't want to be pregnant with twins. So that was my choice to not inject me with more than one. You know, the first one didn't take. And that was really sad. I kind of felt like I'd let them down. And and of course, they were so sweet. They were like, no, you know, this is just a part of it. And the second one did take. So a couple months later, it took and I was pregnant. And then I had to stay on the medication for quite a while because everything's still a little rocky and uncertain. And, um, you know, they just had to kind of keep it going for a little bit. And after that first trimester was over, I was able to just have a normal pregnancy. Did you feel, now every pregnancy is different. Did Mm -hmm. you feel different, like with morning sickness or nausea, you know, with their embryo compared to your daughter's? A hundred percent. And I don't know if it was the medication or just a different... I don't, but I did. I really did. I was <laughs> well, I was going to ask, is it, a, are you allowed to tell me, is it a boy or a girl? I was like, sometimes it that was makes a girl. another girl. Yeah. Okay. So she was another girl and, and I was sick as a dog. I was so tired. I kept wondering too. I was like, is it because I'm older now? Is it like, what is this? I was, oh my gosh, I couldn't do food. Like if, if somebody was cooking in the house, I had to leave. I was just, it was really terrible. And I had been a little bit sick with my, with my girls, but this was next level. And I thankfully after the, I thought it was going to last the whole pregnancy. I was totally miserable. I'm like, what did I do? I did this to myself. Um, but after that first trimester, I was much better and sailed through the rest of the pregnancy. Same as I did with my other two. I even taught my yoga classes all the way up until giving birth. Incredible. I would like to give you a high five for that. (laughs) (laughs) I did zero working out during my pregnancies. So (laughs) that is pretty much my workout was just teaching. (laughs) Yes. I'm like, that is amazing. Okay. I want to rewind though, because we've gone so fast that I'm like, wait, wait, I've got so many questions. Once (laughs) they do the transfer and this is Mm -hmm. considered an IVF surrogate transfer. Yeah. How many days until you find out you're pregnant? Well, some surrogates will start testing right away. They'll, okay. they'll, they'll buy the test. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to wait because I thought it'd be too disappointing if it didn't. So I think they called me trying to, it's very soon. I'm trying to remember if it was a week or two weeks later, but you go in for a blood test. Okay. And Did the you know? is already about a week old. Okay. At implantation. Yeah. Okay. So did you 
did you know, like, were you like, I'm, or were the medicines making you confused about that feeling? I, I was very confused because the first time when it didn't take, I thought for sure that I was because I felt so pregnant. So the second time I kind of didn't really trust it. I thought, well, I feel pregnant, but we'll see. (laughs) Okay. And if the embryo is already, I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but this is fascinating to me. So if the embryo is already like a week old and then, so how do they establish your due date? Like, do they do 266 days minus seven? That was confusing to me too. Um, Still, I don't really know. Okay. <laughs> I, I just kind of went along with the things that they were, I was just sure, you know, whatever the things that they were telling me. I, I thought that it was pretty miraculous and crazy that we were even able, like the science of it all was just really crazy when you're immersed in it and having it all happen to you. So, yeah, I just I just kind of went with. Whatever. With the, the, whatever, whatever, whatever the due date was. Okay, yeah. maybe I'll research that and put that in the show notes because I'm just uh, so curious about it. Okay, so you find out you're pregnant, and then is it? Did this particular family? Did they fly? I mean, I'm assuming you didn't fly to China. Yeah, no. So <laughs> they came to California mm-hmm. to visit, yeah. and did they do that just a few times, or did they come here to? to did they come and live for a while in California? They came a few times during the pregnancy, and then um, they came toward closer to my due date to stay for a little while. And it does take some time to get together the baby's birth certificate. There's a lot of stuff that they had to deal with, with Social Security cards and all that, okay. um, because it's, it's a Chinese citizen born in America. So yeah. I'm sure that that's a legal nightmare for whoever's dealing with that. (laughs) So they do spend some time here and they had a little house rented where they stayed for a couple months before they went back to China altogether. So Jasmine, I, um, I'm really curious about the financial aspect of this. I cannot even imagine the investment of the um, family that you were the surrogate for. Maybe you know. I was wondering if you knew on either side, like what a typical surrogate gets paid to be a Mm -hmm. surrogate. I'm assuming there's financial compensation for taking over your body for nine to 10 months. Yeah, Yeah, there is. And then if there's an agency involved, so I'm assuming in all these legal things. So I was curious if you knew just kind of roughly what this might cost the family and then roughly what one may get paid who is a surrogate. Yeah, well, I do know that it changes from agency to agency. Different agencies charge different amounts. And it also changes uh, depending on the pregnancy. So if it's your first one or your second one, if you're carrying twins or even triplets, um, it all changes the compensation amount. And I don't know how much the family paid. I'm sure that it was an investment. Um, they paid for my insurance. They covered, you know, all kinds of things for me. They even were kind enough to buy me maternity clothes. (laughs) So it was, it was really nice. And they kind of spoiled me. Um, and they also, I got paid $30,000 for the whole pregnancy and it was broken up into payments per month throughout the 10 months. So it was kind of like I was getting paid monthly um, as if it were my job. And I I treated it as my job, you know, and and took it really seriously. That makes sense. And and that's in California. I think it also changes state to state as well. If the pregnancy would have terminated, as an example, would Mm -hmm. you have been paid the full amount or would you still have just been paid up until the month that you were pregnant? I believe it's just up until the month you're pregnant. And I'm trying to remember you actually, before you even go through IVF and start medication, you spend a couple months just drawing up contracts and deciding all of these things. Okay. And there's just sort of a standard contract. And then you go back and forth saying, yes, I'll do this. No, I won't do that. <laughs> and, and you're allowed to, you know, as the surrogate kind of, you have your say in some of the things too. And like you have certain rights that you're allowed to, you know, stand up for yourself in some ways. And then of course the family has their desires, but yeah. So you kind of get to decide and, and you get to name your price too. And I know some people got paid less to be a surrogate. Some people even ask for more. 
That yeah. is, I'm glad that you said that because I'll be honest, I'm going <laughs> to laugh. So I'm sorry. But as you were talking about, and I had a number in my head that I was guessing, I was like, oh, okay, if I was going to be a surrogate, it, I would, I think it would be like around, I would be paid around 60 to $75,000. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was way, way off in that department. Way Yeah, off. well, you know, it was funny because people assumed that I got paid like a lot, you know, and yeah, I was I'm like, really well. shocked at how. And again, you're not doing this to make money. I can hear that from you. You are doing this because this is something that you feel that you were called to do and that you really wanted to support this. I mean, all the things I'm getting from you had nothing to do with uh, anything financial but it's interesting that you're saying that you know different you could you could say oh I wanted more money than than this if you wanted to yeah well and I'm sure there were moments throughout the pregnancy where I wished I'd asked for more money <laughs> <laughs> you know on like a really difficult day and and you know because it is you know I think that you deserve to be compensated when you do something like that because it is it's um it takes puts a little bit of pressure on your family um it takes time it's you know, it's a 24 seven job. I want to hear all about the birth. So the family came, you said they came at the very end mm -hmm. and you were due. And so yeah. did you experience that premature rupture of the membranes again? Or how did your labor unfold? I did not. And with this last labor, you know, I had pretty quick labors with my first two. And this last one, I really got to see how fast a labor can be. <laughs> um, I, I had no signs of labor at all the day that I went into labor. And, but I had a feeling it was that mom intuition. I kind of woke up that morning and I just kind of knew there were no twinges. There were no contractions, but I told my husband, I bet you this baby's coming today and we should stock the pantry with snacks for the kids and just be ready. And um, we were supposed to go to a hospital because the family wanted me to be in a hospital. This was their first baby. And and the hospital was just down the street. It was probably five minutes away. And my husband was like, you have a feeling? Great. Let's go to the hospital right now. And I was like, you are so dramatic. Of course, we're not going to go to the hospital right now. <laughs> like there are they zero won't, signs they of They won't admit you when you're not in labor. <laughs> I know. That's what I told him. I said, no. And he was like, no, you have babies so fast. We should go. And I'm like, no, no you're crazy. And so we go throughout our day, still no signs of labor at all. And I went to eat dinner that night and I sat down on my birth ball. It was kind of pushed up against the table. I sat down and all of a sudden, just this huge surge through my belly. And I almost had to kind of stand up and catch my breath. And I just thought like, whoa, like that, that came out of nowhere. And I said, Hey, I think I just had a, a pretty intense contraction. And then I had to go to the bathroom, which is that's, it just, it just took yeah. off. <laughs> I got it from the birth ball and I said, Hey, I'm going to go pee real quick. And then all of a sudden I'm in the bathroom and it's like contraction, contraction, contraction. And I'm like lifting up off the toilet. And I, I called to my husband and I said, Hey, don't panic, but, uh, I'm definitely in labor. I said, call my grandma to come watch the kids. And he's like, okay. And he goes to call my grandma. But then all of a sudden I had another really big contraction and I had some bloody show. And I, I told him, I don't think we're going to have time to go to the hospital just get my grandma here to watch the kids. And then I kind of, for some reason, just this weird instinct took over and I ran from my clean bathroom to my kid's dirty bathroom. I don't know why, <laughs> <laughs> because that's where I ended up having the baby was on the bathroom floor. I ended up <sighs> you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like minutes later, like you were in labor for minutes. minutes? minutes and we actually I looked at my phone so I in between one of the contractions I texted the parents and I said hey it's time meet me at the hospital and when the baby was born I, I was like I have to look at my phone and see what like how long ago I sent that message and it had been nine minutes nine minutes wow. so <laughs> did your grandma even make it to the house nobody made it anywhere no um, okay <laughs> Like you made it from the birth ball to one bathroom to the next bathroom and delivered a baby. It was, it was so intense. It was so funny. I mean, even looking, I'm just like, how was that even possible? But, um, yeah, I was, you know, sitting on the toilet for one minute and then I just started sort of howling. I knew I could just feel it. I made a noise and I thought, 
oh yeah and then my leg kind of started to shake and I was like oh yeah oh this yeah there are the coming. labor shakes yeah but I as soon as I saw my leg shake I called my husband and I said we're not going to make it you need to call 911 <laughs> Wow. And um, and he was so sweet. And he just he walks in the room and he looks at me and he goes, I knew it. And he just gave me this look like, oh, man, girl, I would be like, I knew it. Take that that look right <laughs> off your face, throw it in the trash can. And I don't want to ever see it again. <laughs> right. I know. And, and he was, oh. but then after that, he was so sweet. He he called 911 and, he, and just the <laughs> calmest, sweetest voice in the other room. I heard him say, so my wife is in labor. What do I do? And um, we ended up just sort of communicating almost like telepathically. Like I was in the bathroom. I couldn't talk anymore at this point because it's coming on so quickly. And I just sort of looked at him and I looked at this waterproof mattress cover that I had just taken off my daughter's bed. So I was like, she doesn't need this anymore. I had it folded up in the corner and he saw that and he unfolded it. And I got down on all fours and he got behind me and, and caught the baby. Oh, how beautiful. And so did the family know that it was a girl? They did, yeah. They did, okay. Yeah, so we were expecting a baby girl, and and she was so cute, so, so cute. It was so funny to give birth to a Chinese baby. Oh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not Chinese, and so it was just like, it was so clearly their baby, and she was oh. so quiet and so wonderful and so sweet and my husband held her and then the firefighters came in a few minutes later <laughs> and uh, they transported me to the hospital okay more questions I'm like hold yeah. on um, when did your water break I don't know I I tried to remember that and I don't remember a moment of water breaking so I don't know if maybe it happened when I was on the toilet uh, maybe I don't think it happened while I was pushing though Okay. So at some point it did. Well, you could have had it. low fluid too. So there couldn't just not have been that much amniotic fluid you know, yeah. at the end. Oh my goodness. Okay. So then you're like on all fours. Was that um, your birthing position for your second birth on all fours? No, it wasn't. Both okay. my first daughter and my second daughter, I laid on my side and that's where I was the most comfortable. Okay. And um, I just got on all fours just sort of out of instinct. It okay. just felt like the right thing to do. Our bodies lead and guide us, I believe, based on the positioning of the baby. I mean, if that the shoulder or the head is turned, I think our bodies just tell us exactly how to move and where to go. I've been in labor so many times where the moms have just said, no, I, ha I have to move. I have to go over here. I have to do this. You know, that yeah. the, the body is just being led. So your husband catches this beautiful baby girl. Yeah. And I'm assuming he's behind you. He's behind right. me, yeah. Okay, so then is there like a pass the baby through your legs <laughs> to the front of you <laughs> so that you can hold the baby? Like, how does this happen? I'm assuming he doesn't cut the umbilical cord. I'm no. assuming. Yeah, it was sort of a weird moment because um, it was just me sort of realizing why well, I just had this baby and it wasn't my baby. So my first instinct would have been to grab the baby and start breastfeeding her. Um, but I didn't want to overstep any boundaries because we hadn't really discussed that with the family, if that's something they were comfortable with. So right as I was awkwardly trying to figure out how to turn myself around so that I could be with my husband and the baby, that's when the firefighters came in. So they actually okay. took over and they cut the cord and they kept me on all fours for a little while. And then they put me in one of those, um, not like a stretcher, but it was kind of like a stretcher that was like a blanket. <laughs> they, they kind of got Lifted me all tucked you up, in and yeah. there. Yeah. And then actually one of the firefighters sort of took over and held the baby and I didn't hold her until we got into the ambulance. And then I held her and she just was quiet. She didn't make a peep the whole time. She was so alert, was looking around, being all sweet. And then when we got to the hospital, um, her parents were there and they were so surprised <laughs> that she was already there because, of course, they were expecting to come to the hospital and for her to be born there. And I, almost, you know, I felt kind of bad. I was like, I'm sorry that it just happened so fast. But here's your baby. <laughs> oh. um, so so was, did you ever nurse? I never did. Never did. No. Okay. Yeah. It was something that I don't think they were very comfortable with. And I offered to pump uh, breast milk to give to the baby. And I could tell she wanted to get a hang of the bottles. And I mm -hmm. said, you know what? That's fine. You're the mom and, and you decide. So yeah. Yeah. There may so be some did. cultural differences there too, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, and that was something I didn't know a lot about their culture, how they do, you know, 
how they do postpartum. So I wanted to be really respectful. Oh, I love it. So you get where where was the placenta, by the way? Did you deliver the placenta at home or in the ambulance? I actually delivered the placenta in the hospital. In the it hospital. took a while to come out. They had to give me some Pitocin and, and get it out. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't retained or anything. It just took a long time. No, it just it just was taking a while. Like long enough where they were starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. And especially because we came in with this like accidental home birth, they were kind of tis tisking us, you know. Oh, right. <laughs> like as if you had control of it. I know. <laughs> like I did it on purpose or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so you're and and for anyone listening, it can take up to an hour or more for the placenta to release, but it usually releases within five to thirty minutes. Um, so it sounds like this took a little bit longer. So Jasmine, you get to the hospital and you you're disconnected. The cord is cut. The baby is theirs. When we are having a physiological birth, I will kind of dive in or lean in right now to the famous Dr. Sarah Buckley, who has studied the physiology of birth. So right after the birth, you're having these surges um, Mm -hmm. of oxytocin and beta endorphins, and the baby is not with you. Yeah. Did that, I just was hoping you might take a minute and walk us through what it's like to carry a baby that you know is not yours, that you're giving as a gift to a family that it belongs to them, mm-hmm. and but not having any of that immediate bonding, skin to skin time. It sounds like you just held the baby for a very short period of time. Yeah. So tell me how that was for you. That was an interesting experience for me because I had mentally prepared for it and I even knew I might be a little sad, Um, but I was unprepared for how it would feel on sort of um, a deep kind of inner instinctual level. It was sad for me. It was a little bit hard for me. I had bought a, uh, a belly bind and I wrapped up my belly in the hospital so that while I was recovering, I'd sort of feel kind of held. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really glad that I did that. Um, There was, you know, of course, there was just kind of the birth was so wild and crazy. It was, I was kind of on a high and kind of excited and happy that I did it. And it was so amazing. But it was also then, you know, my body is totally empty and I felt a little lonely. My husband had to go home and be with our two girls, which I had planned and agreed to. But it was a little sad and I wish that I had really let myself feel those feelings initially because it took a little while for me to really admit that because going into it, I knew it wasn't going to be my baby. So I thought, well, how can I feel sad if I did this on purpose? (laughs) Um, And I would say, yeah, I mean, I would just chime in right there on when you study the science and the physiology of birth You know, these are natural hormones and instincts that are created because we're mammals so that we will protect our young, you know, whether they're with us or not. All of those hormones that are pushing you towards connecting and bonding and protecting your young, all physiologically, those are all still there for you. So tell me about the um, placenta. Were you able to encapsulate the placenta for yourself? Yes, I was. And I was really excited to do that. I brought it home. I did some prints so that I would have those. And it felt like it felt like I was able to take something home for myself and sort of nourish myself in another way. And uh, I didn't really plan well for my postpartum with my second daughter. And so this time, I knew that I was going to just pour so much love into this postpartum period and I was going to mother myself as if I were the newborn. And I kind of did that. That is so beautifully said. Oh, so, oh my goodness. This is where I have a couple of questions on nursing because I'm assuming you had a decision, right? Like likely your milk was going to come in. Yes. And so you could, and you were finished, you had weaned your children. Mm -hmm. So... 
maybe you could be a milk donor or you could do things to, I'm assuming if you're a surrogate, you could choose to then be a milk donor or give mm-hmm. the milk to the a biological family. So in this case, the biological family said, no, thank you. So now mm-hmm. your choices are stop the milk from coming in or mm-hmm. pump the milk as a donation for another family. Where, yeah, well, how did you feel about that? Initially, I had planned to pump and donate. I thought, you know, the milk was going to come in anyway. I'm a huge fan of breastfeeding, and I thought it would be a really sweet thing to do. And after the baby was born, I honestly had this feeling of I had just given so much for so long, and I had given my body to other places for so long that when it came down to it and I looked at that pump, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I just couldn't give anymore. <laughs> I think and that, that was goes, just a personal thing I did for myself. And I think that just goes right back to what you just said about mothering yourself and taking care yeah. of yourself. So I am very proud of you for acknowledging that and for making that decision for your body. So yeah. did you have to take any special measures to prevent your milk besides not pumping? but to like uh, suppress the milk from coming in and to get it to dry up quickly? Um, I tried taking herbs just like as a tea, but my milk came in really quickly and a lot. It was incredibly painful, actually. (laughs) Um, I became very quickly engorged with milk, um, kind of like surprisingly fast. It was just a couple days after the baby was born. I was already just so full. My breasts hurt so badly. And yeah, I just continue to drink herbs and teas and just sort of wait (laughs) for it to kind of go away. And it did eventually. Um, Sometimes for a little bit of relief, I would just kind of get some milk out in the shower, but I would try so hard not to too much because I didn't want to stimulate more milk coming in. Did you do anything like when I had a lot of milk on my second and I just remember being... I was... I I love that you nursed until three and I could just hold all the moms that nurse throughout. But from my second, I was touched out at about a year old. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. but I had so much milk. I mean, he was nowhere near weaning and my milk was not going anywhere. And so I, I bought cabbage leaves. I mean, like my husband would have to go and buy all the cabbage in the grocery store because you would put it over your breasts and then it would wilt the cabbage so quickly and become warm. And then, yeah, I did do a little bit of that. Okay. Yeah. And then on the really hard days. (laughs) Yes. On the really hard days. And then I know peppermint oil um, or eucalyptus is another thing that can help dry up your milk. Um, Some Mm -hmm. women will take Sudafed, um, you know, a medication that dries secretions is pretty effective. I'm just trying to think of right now, if anyone's listening and they're either done nursing or they're not interested in nursing for whatever reason. I know there are many women, um, especially victims of sexual assault, that have a very difficult time crossing the bridge to nursing. And we have to honor that and help them. You know, I believe that we need to honor that and help them so that they don't have to do something for their body that they're not interested in doing or that doesn't feel safe for them. The tea that I drink, I can try to remember what it was called. I didn't do a lot of research because I thought that I was going to pump. So I didn't have a lot on hand for that. But the tea had a very like just obvious name. It was something like no more milk tea. So I think that it worked pretty well. And as quickly as your milk came in within a couple of days, how long would you say it took before you felt like you were dry? Probably about a week. Oh, that's much faster than I would have um, expected. Now, tell me about the postpartum process, because your body goes through all of the same things. So over those couple of months, were you able to get sleep and rest or was your body waking you up like kind of walk me through what postpartum looks like sun up to sun down just nurtured myself I cooked myself meals from the book uh, the first 40 days and I love that cookbook it's so beautiful and um, I gave it to my husband and he actually cooked a lot of meals for me from the cookbook and and I just I got all my favorite books to read and I got books from the library and I started little crafting projects and I drank lots of teas and ate a lot of nourishing foods and I slept so well. I did the Bangkok belly binding on myself and I would 
give myself a massage, like a full warm oil massage, get into the bath and then get out and put the belly bind on and then go to sleep. Now, where were your daughters? Was your husband just really doing a good job taking care of your older daughters? Yes. So that he, could... he is very good at that. He's very, very good at that. Um, so you had yeah. protected space that was just for you. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we actually homeschool our kids too. So he took on the homeschooling and he enjoyed it. You know, it sounds like it was a lot for him, but at the time he was working a lot and he really enjoyed being able to take care of me. And he enjoyed the one-on-one time with the girls. So it was really, really sweet because he had sort of been missing out on some of that. So he had, you know, homeschooling lessons planned and did all kinds of fun things with them. And so it was really kind of nice for all of us. In your planning, how long was your postpartum care plan for? Uh, I had planned for about two months. Okay. But I only had those three weeks with my husband. So I Mm -hmm. really, really planned those three weeks. Like I knew those would be the real juicy good days. Yeah. (laughs) And then I, you know, took time off from teaching because I had taught my yoga classes all the way up to the point. And I was even taking birth clients like pretty much into my ninth month of pregnancy. (laughs) And so I took time off and, uh, yeah, tried to give myself some space Okay, for sure. And I I told myself, even if I feel good, I'm still going to (laughs) rest because I kind of learned my lesson after my second daughter's birth. (laughs) Everyone I hope is listening and learning right now. Just listen and learn (laughs) about Jasmine, the number one self-care mom in the country. (laughs) (laughs) this is amazing we're kind of getting a little close to our the end of our time together and it makes me sad because I've enjoyed every just minute of talking to you but a few months after this journey you became ill and I don't want to conclude our podcast without you sharing just a little bit of that story about you know, you've been so selfless and giving with your body and you've given yourself all this good self-care. And then what happened? Yeah, it, it was pretty rough because that's how I felt. I was like, wait, I've done so many good things. <laughs> Why is this happening? But the same family that I had just had a baby for, they wanted, their dream family was to have two children. They wanted to have two baby girls, just like I had. And, um, they asked me if I would be a surrogate for them again. And I wanted to wait a little while to recover, but they were really excited. They wanted to have them very close in age. And so I said, okay, well give me at least six months to recover. But because there's so much paperwork and things involved, we started getting ready for another surrogate journey around four months postpartum. And I went in for the routine blood work Mm -hmm. to make sure I was nice and healthy, which I had just been nice and healthy during my pregnancies. And um, they, my numbers kept coming back really funny. And this was kind of right around the holidays at the end of 2017. And my white blood cell count was just really weird. And I felt fine. I felt tired, but I had just had a baby. So I figured, well, I'm a mom of two kids and I run a business. And so, of course, I'm tired. And so I went in for more blood work. They said, maybe it was a mistake. Go ahead and go back in, get retested. I got retested. Nope still coming back funny. And so then they started sending me to blood specialists and they started monitoring my blood work. They still don't know what's going on. I'm still feeling pretty much fine. And at this point, I'm just sort of getting frustrated because I'm thinking like, well, if I'm going to be a surrogate one more time, I kind of want to get on it. Like, (laughs) I don't want to be waiting for forever and ever. I wasn't even sure if I was feeling totally committed because like I said, like, I felt like I'd already given so much. So I, looking back, I wonder if maybe I was really kind of stretching myself too thin at this point in my life, um, just being a little bit too selfless, a little bit too giving. And finally, somebody said, like, at first they were telling me, no, you're completely fine. You can go, you can move on with your life. Like, we don't know what's wrong with you, but it's probably just some sort of weird, you know, thing that, that doesn't mean anything. And the IVF doctor said, no, I'm not going to work with you until somebody does a biopsy. So it was actually him and the surrogate pregnancy that probably saved my life because I would have never gone to a doctor otherwise. I just didn't have a reason to. And they did a bone marrow biopsy and called me the day after Easter. And the doctor 
you know, I picked up the phone and she said, Jasmine, are your kids around? And I said, yeah. She said, I want you to go into the other room. And I just thought, I just want to hang up the phone now. I don't want to know what you have to say. <laughs> and so I went to the other room and she said, are you sitting down? And I said, yes. And she said, okay, you have something called acute myeloid leukemia. It's a really fast acting leukemia. I want you to pack your bag. You're going into the hospital today. And that's what we did. I kind of was in shock. And I told my husband, take the kids to my mom's house. I'm really sick. We have to go to the hospital. And by some sort of blessing, it actually ended up that I didn't go to the hospital that day. And I was able to reevaluate the hospital they were sending me to. And I started to advocate for myself. I was able to get care at a different, much better hospital. Later that week, I got admitted and they started chemotherapy right away. I was admitted, I, I started chemotherapy and went through three rounds of chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant all throughout 2018. This is where I'm going to interject. Um, it's really hard for me as a birth story podcast because I don't know what to say <laughs> when someone tells you that they have given their body and then four months postpartum, they get diagnosed with cancer. I'm just a little bit I'm mad for you. Oh, I'm also in just a little bit of shock and I'm also feeling a little bit of angry things. But what I think I'm hearing from you, though, is that you had a donor also if you had a bone yeah. marrow transplant. Yeah, so I that did. means they quickly found a match for you. It was very fast. In fact, everything was so beautifully aligned. It was such a scary diagnosis and it was such a scary time, but the timing of it was incredible that I was able to go from this very scary diagnosis to then having some of the best doctors in the world are on my team still and then getting this bone marrow transplant done so quickly. And um, I've healed incredibly well. And it's, it's really just been kind of divine how it sort of unfolded and worked out. And it, it happened that somebody that I was very close to in my life before children, her mom had had AML, the same type of leukemia that I had, and had gone through treatment at this uh, very, very good hospital in California. And I was able to get in touch with her after not speaking to her for years and years. Uh, she kind of became my my person, my touchstone, and sort of guided me through the process. And um, and it just, yeah, they kept telling me, you know, we don't know how long it'll take until we have a donor for you. And then, oh, okay, we found a donor for you, and it's a hundred percent match. And you're young and healthy, and you're gonna do great. And and it, yeah, and you know, I, I'm in contact with my donor doctor to this day, and my one year anniversary of my new stem cells. So it's kind of coming up. <laughs> so you're, what is, what does a donor doctor mean? Uh, he was the one that did my transplant. Oh, he did the transplant. I thought maybe yeah. your donor was a doctor. <laughs> no, I actually don't get to meet my donor until I've been, until it's been one year. So I'll be meeting them next year. All I know is that they're from Germany. Okay. My, my mind's blown even more on the international side. <laughs> like I'm, I'm in it's a, a box world. for some reason tonight in this interview, I'm in a box. I don't know why it is a small world. I, for some, so this, the registry is clearly, um, international, uh, yeah. registry. So, Oh, I shouldn't say this out loud on, but I'm going to. Um, so one of my friends from middle school passed away a few months ago and was wow. not able to find a, um, a match, uh, waited and yeah. waited and waited and waited and waited, um, in oh the hospital, gosh. um, and wasn't able to find a match. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, but, um, as we yeah. conclude our podcast and just kind of hold space for what you did, what you um, have overcome, overcome, listen to me, <laughs> what you have overcome, what could, if someone's listening today, you know, they've tuned in to hear about the birth story podcast and instead we are going to get a whole bunch of um, donors out there. So what could someone do to 
get themselves into the registry to make yeah. sure that they are opening themselves up if they want to, to be a donor for someone with leukemia? Yeah, it's really, really easy to do. Be the match online. You can just Google it, be the match. And um, I think it's a really simple little blood test that you enter in and it's a sample and then you're in the registry and it sounds really scary and dramatic, you know, a bone marrow transplant, but it's actually really similar to giving blood. Um, it's a really easy, simple thing to do, and it really, really does save lives. And a big problem that we have is that it, the stem cells need to line up with your ethnicity, and there's not enough diversity in the registry. So people who have um, really specific ethnicities, they're kind of getting left out, and they're not finding matches. And that's why you hear about this. And yeah, it's it's simple to do. I, I think every single person, it should just be required. And actually, a lot of donors do come from Germany and from other countries because to them, it's just very common and normal to be in the registry. But well, that we don't do that here as much. Well, let's be the change, Jasmine. <laughs> let's, yeah. <laughs> let's be the, the donor doula also in this story, in this conversation. So be the match. If you are listening and you are feeling touched and moved by Jasmine's story of births and her surrogacy and her giving and her fight against uh, leukemia, getting a donor uh, that was a hundred percent match and all of this beauty, then please go to be the match and register to see if you could save someone's life very easily, as Jasmine said, by just giving, it's just like giving blood. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much for being on today. I I feel like my life literally just changed. And oh. <laughs> my sister-in-law uh, is a survivor of leukemia, childhood leukemia, and I've been uh, volunteer, you know, volunteered to be a match since I met my sister-in-law. And so it's just about awareness. And so thank you yeah. so much for for that today. And I also want to tell you, before we sign off, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my favorite podcasts. It's called Terrible. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And it's the host is Nora McInerney. She's mm. um, one of those people that just balances the irony of pain, suffering, joy, laughter, life, and that you can live in the space of having both of those things at the same time. And the yes. stories on her show, I feel like you'd be perfect for. <laughs> um, so we went through your birth stories, but I think Nora could take over on terrible things for asking and get you to really unfold the full story of having AML. So I'm just going to plant that little seed out there for you to okay. go stalk Nora <laughs> on Instagram. Jasmine, yeah. if anyone is interested in following you on Instagram and your your journey and your story, what is your handle? It is Jasmine Rose Dula. And there's an underscore between each of those words. So Jasmine underscore Rose underscore Dula. I have enjoyed learning so much from you on your Instagram. So maybe there's a few others that want to um, follow your journey. And again, we'll post about Be The Match on the show notes. I hope you yeah. have a wonderful day and I hope to meet you in person someday. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want.